maravilloso hablar más de un lenguaje. En general. En general. Hi, Monique. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Yeah. So you are our assembly member representing the 37th district, Correct. right? Uh, Santa right. Barbara and Ventura counties. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. So today we wanted to bring you on the show and get to know you a little bit more. Your trajectory thus far in your career, your life, and you know the experiences that you've had. So let's uh, let's get started. So you grew up in Santa Barbara County. I did. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara, and uh, my family is originally from Mexico, from mm -hmm. Yahualica, Jalisco and El Sitio Zacatecas. Oh, nice. Yes, and uh, my parents met in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, they got married there, that's where uh, I grew up, and nice. I'm so lucky to call the 805 area um, my home. Yeah. I've lived away a few times um, in the Bay Area, New York, but mm -hmm. everything kept bringing me back to the 805. Right, I know the feeling. You Sometimes you do have to get away, but there's something that just tugs at you, right? Right. The yeah. feeling of home is always home, right? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So you and I met, uh, officially met out in, in Yagualica and Jalisco. I remember that we day. We did. <laughs> we were both in Yagualica, Jalisco yeah. at the same time. Yeah. That was, I think, a couple years ago. A couple years ago. Exactly. And um, we ran into each other in the downtown yeah. area mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of a very small town yeah. um, in Los Altos de Jalisco. Exactly. Yeah. That's my other home. I, mm -hmm. No matter where I go, I always carry it with me. Mm -hmm. I I love going back. Do you get to go back often? I don't get to go back um, to my uh, kind of, you know, extended family's hometowns as much okay. as I would like to go. I'd love to go, but the work of California keeps us busy. Yes. Um, but I do try to go on occasion uh, to visit uh, relatives, extended relatives in uh, Mexico. Yeah, good, good. Um, so Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara is definitely in your heart. After you, you know, you got your BA, you went off to school, you got your master's. Uh, at uh, Columbia University. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. So after that you came back. You came back and you worked at UCSB. What did you do there? I did. So I spent, uh, after my undergrad at Berkeley, I came back to the community and I worked with several high school students mm -hmm. um, for a few years and helping them go to college. Then I thought it was time to go on to my graduate program and I earned my master's degree from Columbia University mm -hmm. Teachers College. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I came back and I started working at UC Santa Barbara. I spent mm -hmm. nearly 11 years there and I worked with students who were going into graduate careers. Um, yeah. So into PhDs and masters or, rare, or were already enrolled mm -hmm. in some of those graduate degrees. Um, my job was to create a pathway for students um, to find undergraduate research opportunities to get mm -hmm. to do research with faculty to explore different research areas mm -hmm. that would make them um, more competitive and prepared to apply to doctoral programs that's right and we need that guidance you know we need it from someone who's done it that they understand it that has the same culture background as we do so that we feel that there's someone that supports us and understands the struggles right right um, and and let's go back a little bit. So before you got there, before you were helping everybody else, mm -hmm. what was it like for you to be in, in, in the U.S. And, and speaking two languages, mm -hmm. right? Because this, these are the students also, I'm assuming, that you were helping in your career uh, as a counselor and also at UCSB. Right. So uh, my, my own personal story in mm -hmm. education has absolutely influenced the work that I've done professionally over 14 years. And uh, thinking about what it was like to be the first in my family to go to college, mm -hmm. what it was like to be a student who had to work while going to college, mm -hmm. um, being a student who grew up in a community and was bilingual and spoke two languages, um, all of those elements have certainly influenced how I've thought about education and how to help all students. I think um, the important piece of the work that I've done in education has been about um, taking those aspects um, and those trajectories of what it takes to get to degrees and finding ways for students to be more successful in those pathways and more successful in those trajectories to get those degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been, um, I think, an unbelievable privilege 
to be able to work in the very community that I was raised in, in the very community that invested in my success, and to be able to work with students there and helping them um, move forward to obtain you know, advanced degrees. Um, and, and that's been important. It's been something that has also introduced me to a number of issues. Certainly, students and their families care about what happens in the classroom and the mm -hmm. four walls. Mm -hmm. But the other reality is that for all the students that we work with, they also care about what happens outside of school. They care about health care, about our environment, mm -hmm. about jobs, mm -hmm. housing, transportation. And that's really, I think, what also uh, inspired me to think a little bit outside of my professional background as an educator um, and think more broadly about the policy issues that impact the everyday lives of the students here in this community. Yeah, but it wouldn't probably have affected you as much if you hadn't gone in there first and kind of gone back and assisted these students. I feel like a replay of what you had to go through, right? To kind of go, to really be able to pinpoint the issues of what we need and what we need your help with. Right, and yeah. that's very much the case that um, everyone's own experience has some influence over mm -hmm. the work they do. Mm -hmm. And so being at the table and being able to talk about what it was like to be yes. bilingual, what it was like to be the first in their family to go to college, um, the importance of finding and getting all the classes you need yeah. um, and advisors, all of that absolutely has been part of what I've thought about mm -hmm. um, when working on programs and with students in our community. Yeah, and again, going back to the experience, your personal experience with the language, you know, and, and putting that up to the front, what was it like for you? Is there a particular, well, first I guess I should ask, so if you're like me, you grew up speaking Spanish at home, um, what was it once you got to school, what was it like for you? Some people did ESL, some people did dual immersion, um, some of us just got placed in classes that just were all English. What was that like for you? I grew up and I was an English language learner growing up. Okay. Um, I was born uh, in the here in, in the Santa Barbara Ventura area mm -hmm. um, and I uh, started school. And like so many families, one of the first things that our parents have to do or mm -hmm. our guardians have to do is fill out a language. Um, form. It's the family language survey that's giving out to all families uh, that have students in the public school system in the state of California. Mm -hmm. And in that form, parents indicate whether their kids speak a language other than English or if they're bilingual at home. And so my parents uh, indicated that I was bilingual and um, that I spoke Spanish at home and I became an ESL student. Mm -hmm. And um, at about third grade, I transitioned out of ESL. And at the time, it's challenging as a student uh, when you are learning more than one language. But now, in retrospect, uh, it, it's, an, it's an incredible asset and a skill to have. Mm -hmm. um, knowing more than one language in our state, in the world, mm -hmm. um, really helps uh, individuals professionally. And I think you're able to communicate to more people, you're able to take advantage of opportunities that might not otherwise be there if you were limited uh, to just one language. I know that that's a model that really the world has adopted. You see so many uh, educational systems throughout the world mm -hmm. where students will learn two or three languages and that is the norm uh, and so I think that for me I feel very blessed and uh, lucky that I was able to really hone in on multiple skills as someone who's bilingual very early on. Yeah, do you speak any other languages? I don't. In high school I did take French uh, and I learned how to say je m'appelle Monique, right? I know yeah. what my name is. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, you know, it, it's very minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing about language is that we become more proficient the more we practice the language. And so when you lose it and you only take it as a course and you don't practice it, um, as the older you get, the more you lose it. So uh, I, I think that that's where I lost it. But I did take a third language. Well, you have a, still a PhD option, maybe. You can, you know, <laughs> apply it's out there. It's never too late to learn. <laughs> never too right? late to learn. Uh, the brain just works differently when yes. you're younger and when you're older, but never too late to learn. I agree mm -hmm. with you. But it's never, yeah, always a chance. Maybe I will someday retire in a different country or something. <laughs> and. I will practice a third language. There you mm -hmm. go, right? Keep your options open. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Um, and while you were working with the students, with whether it was in high school, USSB, 
Was there a particular story that comes to mind or a particular challenge that you saw a student or even in your uh, career, in the education career, a story that you said, you know, there's an issue here and that may have inspired the rest of your career to go into politics that you saw where there was a need maybe? I, over the 14 years that I spent in education, I've worked with thousands of students in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. Mm -hmm. And certainly there are many stories. Um, there are names of students um, and their stories and their history that I will never forget um, because they've left an impression. Um, I think over the last years that I worked at UC Santa Barbara, the story of many students in terms of taking classes, really being concerned about tuition mm -hmm. and trying to identify how they were going to graduate with the least amount of debt was very real. One of the first pieces of legislation that I introduced um, when I got to the State Assembly was legislation around student hunger. Mm. And when I worked at UCSB, there was a time where we received an email as staff ask, uh, around the holidays asking if there was any food that we wanted to donate for a pantry. And through the years, it went from staff donations for a food pantry to a um, somewhat more uh, formal Ex program okay. um, in terms of creating a food pantry for college students. Okay. Because what we were seeing was that the cost of tuition was going up, the cost of living was going up, but not to the you know, proportion or rate that their jobs mm -hmm. um, would be comparable. And food, insecurity and hunger became more of an issue, not just for our counties and for young students, but also for college students. Mm -hmm. And when I first got elected, we had some students at UCSB come to us and they said, we really want to work on this issue. It's an issue for students all across the country mm -hmm. and certainly an issue for students going to colleges and universities in the area. Mm -hmm. And it's that story that history of watching what the food hunger uh, issue has become in our country yeah. and our state that uh, you know kind of compelled me to move forward legislation and we were successful in getting 7.5 million dollars over a five-year period um, to assist higher education programs in expanding mm -hmm. their food hunger programs and working with CalFresh and working mm -hmm. with local food banks and uh, working to make sure that we're using the technology in the most creative ways to help students so that they can be successful. Because what we know is that a student who is hungry mm -hmm. will not be successful. And crazy. so that is very important, um, that students are healthy um, in school and, and that's when students can be more successful. Definitely, uh, you definitely touched on the very important aspect, no matter what year it is, no matter what you know decade it is, it's always an issue, definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and we thank you for that. We thank mm -hmm. you for putting your time into that. You Absolutely. Know? Because it's such a basic need. It that is. sometimes above all the noise, you kind of forget about that. And if you don't have it taken care of, everything else is difficult. Learning is difficult. Absolutely, and, and that's really key what you just said, that it's a basic need. Mm -hmm. And for so many people in our state, if their basic needs aren't met, um, it's very difficult for them to be successful outside of their basic needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, totally. And um, in your career, before you started, whose voices did you feel were not so represented? Right? What, what motivated you? to go into not just politics, but even in education, as far as you, who you wanted to represent? I think it's always been about inclusion, not mm -hmm. exclusion. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone in public office, the goal is always to represent everyone mm -hmm. in the best way you can. Mm -hmm. Certainly you can't please everyone. Yeah. I represent 465,000 people or so yeah. um, in the state of California and I would love to be able to please every single one of them, but that's pretty difficult. But you look at the collective interest of that community mm -hmm. and you try to represent everyone as best as you can. And as someone um, who's been part of our community, who was born and raised here, who's watched um, how our community has grown, who's also known that our community has been impacted by wildfires and natural disasters um, since we can remember, um, who's all, who understands that uh, issues related to the environment, including our drought, um, are really important to the economy of a community like this that depends on agriculture. 
Uh, right. you, you really want to make sure that those voices are at the table and they're included. And mm -hmm. I think that that's always been um, important, mm -hmm. that we make sure that we are as diverse as possible to be able to share um, the, the wide lens and perspectives of the issues. Because when we do that, we're able to better get to outcomes uh, that help our community as a whole. And that's what we want. We want everyone to be successful. We want everyone uh, to have a chance. And we know that there's a lot of imperfection and things that don't work. And so we're constantly trying to identify what are the best pra practices? How do you replicate mm -hmm. uh, success in our community? And that's hard to do in a yeah. state like California that's the fifth largest economy in the world with 40 million people. Mm -hmm. But we certainly get up every day and do our best um, and try to make sure we can do that. Oh, I bet. <laughs> the minute you wake up, okay, mm -hmm. let's go do this. Mm -hmm. um, and as a female, as a Latina female, how does that play a role in your work, right? Because there's many of us who, who ad admire people like you who've gone, you know, you've gone, you've broken ceilings and that's not easy. And so how, how does that, how do you make sure to represent other young Latina females who are, you know, in their early stages of their career. That's, I mean, I think it's a, it's an added responsibility, right? Uh, to be someone who, by some, is seen as a role model. Mm -hmm. um, certainly as the first woman of color to represent Ventura and Santa Barbara County at the state level, mm -hmm. um, that in and of itself has some weight um, and some responsibility. But uh, the important piece there is that the more we do, the more people see their voice and their history and their experience reflected in some of the work we do. Um, and that goes for everyone. So I think that that's important. It's a role that I don't take lightly. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware. Um, I don't want to be the only to be in this role. Mm -hmm. um, the goal, right, is for people all around to also see someone who's from the area mm -hmm. that can serve in this role, mm -hmm. to see someone um, who is younger to serve in this role, right? We yeah. want generational diversity, regional diversity mm -hmm. uh, as well. And I think um, as a woman, uh, women make up less than a quarter of the state legislature. So out of 120 legislators, uh, women make up less than a quarter. Yeah. And we still work at that. Yeah. Um, we think it's really important for the voice of women to be there as well. And uh, we, we know that, again, it goes back to this, the, the simple key part to an equation, that the more perspectives are at the table, the more it allows us to think broadly about different ways to get to a solution. Mm -hmm. no, that's definitely very poignant. Um, when you were working with students, I, I like to go back to the students mm -hmm. just to make sure we answer all of their questions if they're watching, um, and then tying that with the Latina females. How was that difference when you were working with students, let's just say high school and college, what were the barriers or obstacles that you felt be, that are a little bit more different when you were working with students with females? Mm -hmm. For example, taking from your experience as well, growing up Latina, growing up female in this education system, what were some obstacles, whether it be in language or just in general, that you felt stayed close to you and have driven you to mm -hmm. what you do now? We continue to see some areas and some disciplines, academic disciplines, where mm -hmm. uh, women are underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And I probably felt this a little bit more in graduate education. Okay. Um, and the more you advance in, in education, um, you know, the more there is thought about how we reach mm -hmm. um, kind of diversity there. And I know that there were um, a couple departments that I worked with very early on when I worked at UCSB mm -hmm. that at the time didn't have any women enrolled. Wow. in that particular discipline okay. and uh, we worked really hard and the we, we you know we found um, we ensured that really outreach and recruitment practices brought in the most qualified and the most amazing applicants um, but we we know that that also means that that's going to be a more diverse applicant pool right when mm -hmm. we, there's effort in making sure people know about your academic programs yeah. uh, so it's still something that we see there's still disciplines where you see uh, less diversity versus you know disciplines that are much more diverse yeah. I think in the end what's important is that we create a strong economy and a strong workforce that represents whatever 
California looks for. Um, that's probably a model that's the strongest for the state. Mm -hmm. When we have individuals uh, who are prepared and ready to take on the jobs of the future, mm -hmm. um, who really kind of are people that are, you know, representative of the state of California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you were recruiting, when you saw that there was a deficiency there, what could you say that maybe language had a barrier, that that was part of the problem? Or was it just, like we said, just basic needs, just meeting basic needs before they can think of anything else? When working with students, mm -hmm. um, whether it was recruiting students from high school to go to college mm -hmm. or college to go to grad school, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we know is that uh, everyone, you know, everyone's backgrounds are a little bit different. And so uh, very often we look at, for example, students who are first in their family to go to college. The system uh, is understood differently because they don't have a relative who can help them mm -hmm. and who can guide them mm -hmm. and who in addition to whatever support they're receiving at school could provide that kind of support at home. And so first generation college bound stu students certainly um, have uh, some, uh, I, I think some similarities, obviously not mm -hmm. every student is identical, but some similarities yeah. in some of the obstacles that we see, as do uh, students who come from low-income backgrounds. Mm -hmm. When uh, students come from low-income backgrounds, we know that meeting the basic needs of housing, health, and food um, are, is, is harder. Yeah. Um, it's certainly harder um, in areas like Ventura and Santa Barbara where the cost of living is so high. Yeah. And uh, we know that they, it requires assistance. It requires programs like work study right? Work study was designed to help the very students that had to yeah. work um, in order to be able to afford their education, but do so on campus, mm -hmm. right? Do so through a partnership with the university. We have seen a number of programs in higher ed institute, um, instituted for students um, to make sure that they are successful because when you admit a student who is eligible, qualified, and just simply amazing, mm -hmm. you want them to be yeah. doing well in school. You want them to be able to get that college degree and you know that there will be obstacles. So there are universities and colleges that have programs for first year students, for transfer students, mm -hmm. for students who are first in their family to go to college, um, for students that are pursuing majors that are um, considered non-traditional in a particular field. Yeah. Um, we've really instituted a number of programs. Yeah, no, you're doing great work. We mm -hmm. thank you for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, before we uh, finish up here, anything that, uh, again, any, any story that pops in your head that really tugs at your heart, that keeps you going, right, that you saw, whether it was your students, your family, that reminds you whenever, not that you forget, mm -hmm. but on the tough days, right, that we need a little reminder of why we do what we do. Anything you'd like to share with us as far as a, a story that stays with you. You don't have to name names, mm -hmm. just the obstacle or the challenge or the, you know, what the person may have gone through. Yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's, again, a number of stories, but mm -hmm. I think the thing that keeps me going, even on hard days, because we all have them. Yes. We have them whether we're in school or whether we're working or retired. Yeah. There's just days that are hard. And um, in those days and in those moments, I, I really think of the students and the families and the individuals in our community that I've been able to help. And probably what most stays with me are individuals who I helped years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, I may not have realized how much my assistance meant to them, mm -hmm. um, but years later, they look you in the eye, they squeeze your hand tight, and thank you. Mm -hmm. And that thank you is something that we hold on to because it means something. It means something, um, not just to the individual that you were able to assist, mm -hmm. but also to you that you realize even years later, it's that important reminder that something you did helped someone mm -hmm. at that particular moment in time and they needed it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we hold on to. Uh, certainly, uh, that doesn't happen every day. And again, it's, you know, we're a state that has imperfections. Um, our, you know, our systems, our schools have imperfections, but we work, you know, all we can do as elected officials is wake up that day, mm -hmm. go to work, mm -hmm. do the best we can to try to represent the people and assist yeah. the people that we are elected to serve and then do it again the next day. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that that's probably what most tugs at my heart. Um, and uh, 
you know, that happens, uh, you know, every once in a while. Uh, I, I, you know, on Halloween, I was uh, handing out toothbrushes uh, to, <laughs> nice. uh, st to uh, students or kids in a neighborhood. Always taking care right? of us, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, it was like toothbrushes <laughs> and coloring books. Um, and uh, a student that I had worked with years ago looked at me and said, do you remember me? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, how are you? Aww. Married with kids and, you know, still has that connection. Look and that's that. important. That's very important. I'm so glad you touched on that um, because I, I understand how difficult it is in your field. And not that we need reminders, but it is good to tell people. It is mm -hmm. good to reach out and tell them. Every once in a while, I'll hit up my, uh, my high school mm -hmm. teachers. And it's definitely nice to get those, those hey, just in case you were wondering, because you meet many, many people. You come across many people. And you, like you said, you don't know. You don't know. So thank you for sharing that Absolutely. with us. Yeah, thank yeah. you for being here. Um, we're done for today. These are very inspiring stories. And again, we appreciate everything that you do for us. Great. Thank you, Acelia. Thank you to the whole crew yeah. uh, for putting this show together. Yeah, thank you so Thanks. much. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank <laughs> you.